Something walks whistling past my house every night at 3.03 a.m. Every night, no matter the weather, something walks down our street whistling softly. You can only hear it if you're in the living room or the kitchen when they walk by, and it always starts at exactly 3.03. The sound starts faint, somewhere near the beginning of the lane near the Carson place. We're towards the middle of the street, so the whistling moves past us before fading away in the direction of the cul-de-sac. When I was younger, my sister and I would sneak into the kitchen some nights just to listen. Mom and Dad didn't like that, and we'd catch hell if they found us out there. But they were never too hard on us, since we always stuck to the one big rule. Don't try to look at whatever was whistling. My neighborhood is a funny place. I've lived here since I was six, and I love it. The houses are small but well kept. Good-sized yards and plenty of room to roam. There are a lot of kids here my age. I turned 13 back in October. We grew up together and we would always play four square in the cul-de-sac. Or we would roam around from back porch to back porch in the summer. It was a good place to grow up. I'm old enough to see it. And there's only two strange things here. The night whistling and the good luck. The whistling never bothered me much. Like I said, I couldn't even hear it from my bedroom. But mom and dad don't like talking about it, so I've stopped asking questions. My dad is tall and strong, but very calm and mild-tempered. The only time he isn't calm is if the whistler comes up. My dad is a strong guy, tall and calm. He has an accent since he moved to the U.S. as a kid. His family, my grandparents, they're from the islands. That's what they call it. My dad, the only time he isn't so calm is if the whistler comes up. He talks a little quicker, then eyes move faster, and he tells us not to think about it so much and to always remember the one rule, the one big rule. Don't try to look outside the window when the whistler goes past. Not that we could look even if we want it. See, there are shutters on the inside of our windows. Thick pieces of heavy canvas that pull down from the top and latch to the bottom of the window frame. Each latch even has a small lock, about the size of what you would find on a diary. My dad locks those shutters every night before we all go to bed and keeps the key in his room. My mom, I don't know what she thinks about the whistling. I've seen her out in the living room before at 3.03 when the sound starts. I could see her if I cracked my door open just an inch to peek. She just sits on our big red couch listening. My mom, I think once or twice a month, she just sits on our big red couch listening to the whistling. The whistler has the same tune every night. It's cheerful. <laughs> Sorry guys, that's the best whistling I can do. <laughs> Remember how I said there are two odd things about where I live? Well, besides our night whistler, everyone in my neighborhood is really lucky. It's hard to explain, and my dad doesn't like us talking about this part much either. But good things just seem to happen to the people around here a lot. Usually, it's small things. Winning a radio contest, or getting an unexpected promotion at work, or finding some arrowheads buried in the yard. You know, the authentic kind. The weather is pretty good and there's no crime and everyone's gardens always bloom extra bright in the fall. A million little blessings. That's what my mom would say about living here. A million little blessings. I've heard my mom say that about living here. But the main reason we stay here, why we moved here in the first place, is my sister Nola. She was born very sick, something with her lungs. Couldn't even bring her home when she was born, only visit her in the hospital. She was so small. I remember, small even compared to other babies. A machine had to breathe for her. We moved into our house here to be closer to the hospital. As soon as we moved here, Nola started getting better. The doctors couldn't figure it out. They chalked it up to whatever they were doing, but we all could tell that they were confused. But my parents knew, even I knew. Nola getting better was just another of the million little blessings we got from living in our neighborhood. So that's why we stayed, even after we found out that for every small miracle that happens here every day, now and then, something bad happens. But the only way that something bad happens is if you look for the whistler. For every small miracle, every now and then, some bad things happen. But they only happen if you look for the whistler. See, our neighborhood has a welcoming committee. They show up with macaroni casserole in a gift basket and a manila folder for whenever someone new moves in. They're very friendly. Four people showed up when we moved in seven years ago. The 
committee made small talk, gave me a Snickers bar. Then they took turns holding Nola. It was her first week out of the hospital, so they were extra careful. Then the committee asked to speak to my parents in private, so I was sent to my room where I managed to hear nearly every word. The welcoming committee told my parents about how nice the neighborhood was. Really exceptionally, hard to explain kind of nice. And then they told my parents about the even harder to explain whistling that happens every morning at 3.03 and ended at the tick of 3.05. The group, our new neighbors, warned my parents that the whistling was quiet, would never harm or hurt us as long as we didn't look for what was making the sound. This part they stressed and I pushed my ear against the door trying to hear every word. People who went looking for the whistler had their luck change, sometimes tragically. A black cloud would hang over anyone that looked. Anything that could go wrong would. The envelope they brought over contained newspaper clippings, stories about car crashes and ruined lives, public deaths and freak accidents. Stories about car crashes and ruined lives, public deaths and freak accidents. Not everyone dies. I heard the head of the committee tell my dad, but the life goes out of them. Even if they live, there's no light in them ever again. No presence. My mom, I could tell she wasn't taking it seriously. She kept asking if this was some prank that they were playing on the new neighbors. At one point, my mom got angry, accused the committee of trying to scare us out of our new home. Then she asked me if they were racist on account of my dad being from the islands. My dad calmed her down and told her that he could tell that our new neighbors were sincere and that they were just trying to help us. He explained that he grew up hearing these kinds of stories from his mom and he knew that there were strange things that walked among us. Some of those strange things were good and some were bad, but most were just different. After the committee left, dad went out to the hardware store, bought the canvas blinds and the latches and locks and installed them on every window in the house after dinner. That first night in our new house, I crept out of my room at 3 a.m only to find my dad awake, sitting on the living room couch, holding my baby sister. My dad held up his finger in a shh motion, but patted the couch next to him. I sat and we waited. At exactly 3.03, we heard the whistling. At exactly 3.03, we heard the whistling. It came and went just like our neighbors said. The whistling returns each night and we never look. And we enjoy our million little blessings every day. Nola breathes on her own and she's grown into a strong, clever girl. My dad even joined the welcoming committee. We don't get new neighbors often. Why would anyone want to leave? But when a new family moves in, my dad and the committee bring the macaroni casserole, a gift basket, and the manila folder. I can always tell by the look on my dad's face when he comes back if the family took the committee seriously or if we would be getting new neighbors again very soon. Not long ago, a family moved in directly next to us. The previous owner, Miss Maddie, passed away at 105. She lived a good long life. Our new neighbors seemed like they would fit in just fine. They believed the welcoming committee and took my dad's advice about locking the shutter since they had a young child of their own. Whatever newspaper clippings were in that manila envelope, whatever evidence, my dad never let us see. But I imagine it must have been really convincing since our neighbors got along with no issues for the first month. One night, when our new neighbors had to leave town, they sent their son, Holden, to stay with us. He was 12, a year under me in school. I didn't know him well before that night, but as soon as his parents dropped him off after dinner, I could tell it was going to be a bad time. Do you know who's always out there whistling every night? Holden asked as soon as the adults left the room. We don't talk about that, I said. Do you know who's always out there whistling every night? Holden asked the moment the adults left the room. My sister and I exchanged a glance. We don't talk about that, I said. I think it's that weirdo that lives in that big yellow house on the corner, Holden said. Mr. Tolls? My sister asked. No way, he's really nice. Holden shrugged. Must be a psychotic killer then. Nola tensed. We don't talk about it, I repeated. Let's go to my room and play some Nintendo. We spent the next few hours playing video games, eating popcorn, and watching movies. A typical sleepover, but I could see Holden was getting anxious. After my parents had wished us goodnight, locked the blinds, and gone to bed, 
Holden stood up from his beanbag and walked over to where Nola and I were sitting on my bed. Have you ever even tried looking? He asked. It's nearly time. Like most sleepovers, we conveniently ignored any suggestions of bedtime. I was shocked to see he was right. It was almost 3 a.m. I sighed. We don't talk see, about- See, I can't- I can't even try to look because my dad locks the blinds every night and hides the key. He continued, completely ignoring me. See, I- I can't even try to look at it because my dad locks the blinds every night and hides the key. He continued, ignoring me. So does our dad, said Nola. No replied Holden. No, he doesn't. You saw him do it, I said a little sharper than I meant to sound. Holden grinned. Your dad locks the blinds, yeah, but he doesn't hide the key. He keeps it right on his normal keychain. So? I asked, worried I already knew what he would say next, because I had noticed that my dad didn't bother hiding the key anymore after all of these years, because he knew that we took it seriously. So, after your dad locked up before your parents went to bed, I went to the bathroom. And on my way, I may have peeked into their room. And I may have seen your dad's keychain on his nightstand. And I maybe went and borrowed the keys to the blinds. <laughs> Nola and I stared and his grin only grew wider and wider. Nola and I stared and his grin only grew wider. You're lying, I said. Holden shrugged. You can check if you want. Just open your parents' door and look. You'll see his keychain right there on the nightstand. Stay here, I told both of them. Don't move a muscle. I hurried over to my parents' room but hesitated at the door. If Holden wasn't lying, my dad would be angry. Beyond angry. I was scared thinking about it, but more scared of an open window with a whistler right outside. I opened the door barely an inch and looked in, but it was too dark to see. Taking a deep breath, I walked into the room. Two steps into the dark, I froze. The whistling started, and I could hear it clearly from my parents' room. I never realized, but they must have heard the sound every night since we moved into the house. They never told us. I don't think I could have even slept through it. I stood there, listening to the whistling come closer, unsure whether I should turn on the light or call out for my dad. Soft sounds from the living room brought me back to reality. NOLA! I yelled, running out of my parents' room. Holden and Nola were standing in front of a window. Holden and Nola were standing near the front door next to a window. Holden wasn't lying. I could see him fumbling with the lock on one of the blinds. I heard a click. He did have the key. Holden let out a quick laugh. Nola stood next to him, hunched up. Afraid, but maybe curious? The whistling was right outside our house now. I think I made a sound, called out. I can't remember. Time felt frozen, but I found myself moving. I'm not fast. I've never been athletic. Somehow, though, I covered the space between myself and Nola in a moment. My eyes were locked on her, but I heard Holden pull the blinds all the way down so it could release. I heard the snap of it start to raise, and I heard the whistling just on the other side of the window. I had my arms around Nola, and I turned us so she was facing away from the window. At the same time, I jammed my eyes shut. The blind whipped open. The whistling stopped. I felt Nola shaking in my arms. Don't look, okay? I told her. Don't turn around. My eyes were still closed, but I felt her nod into my shoulder. I reached out with the arm that wasn't holding Nola and tried to touch Holden. My hand brushed against his arm. He was shaking worse than Nola. Holden! I didn't turn back to look at them. My eyes were glued to Holden. He was pale, had bit his lips so hard that there was a thin red line of blood running down his chin, and he'd wet himself. What happened? My dad asked from behind me. I managed to swivel away from Holden and look back. He looked. I'd never seen my dad scared before, but I saw it that night. In that moment, an old, ugly terror stitched on his face. A parent's fear. Jess Holden, he mouthed to me. I nodded yes. My dad let out his breath. He looked so relieved I nearly expected him to cheer. But then he turned to look at Holden and my dad's face changed. I wondered if he felt bad for feeling good that Holden was the only one that looked. There was a knock at the door. We all froze. Holden whimpered. Don't answer it, my mom said. She stood at the threshold of the hall. 
I'd always thought she was a skeptic and that she just humored my dad about the windows and the whistler, but that night, we were all believers. I noticed that both of my parents held baseball bats that they must have taken from their bedroom. The knock came again, a little louder this time. Please, don't open the door, Holden whispered. My dad walked over to him and hugged him close. We won't, my dad promised, still holding his bat. Nothing is coming in here tonight. This time, the knocking was loud enough to rattle the door. Holden screamed again, and Nola clenched her arms around my neck. My mom came over and knelt down next to us, wrapping my sister and me close. Call the police, my mom whispered to my dad. The knocking instantly stopped. My dad looked over at us. You think maybe it was the neighbors? Or we was cut off by frantic knocking that trailed off to a polite tap, tap, tap. Police, something said from the other side of the door. The voice from outside sounded exactly like my mom, like a parrot repeating the words back to her. Police, call the police. Police, call the police. Police, my mom pulled us closer. Police, please stop, I heard her whisper. I don't think calling them will help, my dad said. How will we even know when they're the ones at the door? The knocking came harder than before. The door shook. Then it stopped. After a long moment, I heard the knocking again, but it was coming from our back door. We all turned towards the back door, but the knocking immediately returned to the front door. The knocking kept going from front to back. Then suddenly the sound was coming from both doors at once. Big, heavy blows like a sledgehammer. Then something started rapping against all of the windows of the house. Then the walls. Stop! Holden yelled. The knocking died. I won't tell. Holden said, staring at the door. I promise. I won't tell anyone what I saw. Just please, go away. We waited for nearly a minute. Then we heard it. A soft tap, tap, tap coming from the window Holden had looked through earlier. Holden started to cry, sobbing like a prisoner watching gallows being built outside of their cell. My dad held him close and brushed his hair, but he never lied to him. He never told him that things would be okay. The tapping at the window went on for the rest of the night, and none of us got any sleep. The tapping stopped as soon as the sun came up at around 7 in the morning. After waiting a few more hours, Dad opened the blinds. Then he made us wait in the room as he opened the front door. Okay, he told us. It's done. Holden's parents came back around lunchtime. My mom and dad walked Holden over to his house and they all went outside for quite a while. Nola and I watched from the window. She stuck to me the whole day right by my side. When my parents came back, they looked grim, but they wouldn't tell us what they told Holden's family. That night, everyone slept in my room. There was no knocking that night or any night since. Later that week, there was a moving truck outside of Holden's house. Nola and I watched them move from the window. Holden and his family had polar grim mouths and lifeless eyes. I could tell something was very wrong. His family was gone before sunset. Not everyone who looks at the Whistler dies, but even those that live, the light goes out of them for the rest of their lives. I think Holden's parents must have looked, either to comfort him if they didn't believe him, or share the burden if they did. Sometimes I wonder if I'd been slower, if Nola looked out that window that night, would I have looked too? To comfort her? To share the burden? I'm glad I don't have to find out. We still live in that house, in that neighborhood. We still hear our whistler walking past every night. The blessings, the luck, the good things here are too good to leave. But we're careful. We don't have friends spend the night over anymore. And my dad hides the key to the blinds very, very well. Not that I've gone looking. Some things you just don't need to look for.